Okay. So our um, presentation, it's really the same as the title before, it's just more specific. The Shape of the Future in 2050, Solving the Unfixable Problems of the World with Multifaceted Narrow AI and Youth Creativity, Creating a Positive Medical Future for Everyone. I'm Kim Solas. And I'm Ishita Moke. Okay, uh, we have no disclosures, two surprising facts about us. We are big fans of Yuval Noah Harari, but we also disagree with his assertion that no one knows what the world will be like in 2050. That assumption comes from considering humans as the only actors. If you factor in multifaceted narrow AI, then predictions can be made. We're not unlike you, the audience, but we've had surprising success changing things online. It's hard to find evidence that the things we change were ever different from how they are now. If we could do that, have that potent effect, you could too. That's what we mean by agency on the next slide. So why is it so difficult? Okay, so these are our three main objectives. Um, we'll start at number one. Um, one person has more agency than ever before and can bring about bigger change faster than ever before. So the fallacy of human only scenarios for 2050 Many people fall into this notion that we cannot at all predict uh, the future, uh, what things can be like in 2050. And I think that's because they're only considering humans, uh, human institutions, human beings, what they will do. But if you factor in narrow AI, then I, I think you actually can make some predictions. And the need to factor in narrow AI was already apparent 20 years ago. Um, you may know that Sarah Diamond was the uh, founder of the Bampton Media Center. And for 15 years, she led the um, Ontario Institute of Art and Design. She's one of the major leaders in the tech world in Canada. And five days before September 11th, on September 6, 2001, I was set to give the first presentation in this smart, sexy, healthy event. And I had the Erin Artificial Intelligence Painting screensaver going. And she was introducing me. And you can see it was a very pleasant occasion where we all were mesmerized by the paintings that that artificial intelligence screensaver was doing. And she said, I'm not sure I can compete with this unless I move around a lot. So that was 20 years ago, 17 years ago. The Sony Ibo robotic dog from 2002, this ancient version was able to be a video presenter of poetry on video. And more recently, Deep Minds Alpha Fold, which is in part an Edmonton success story because Deep Mind is headquartered in London, the UK, and in Edmonton. Alpha Fold's success in solving protein folding shows how narrow AI can solve important problems humans could never solve alone. And you could imagine the other things we can't solve global warming, nuclear war, male against male aggression, narrow AI could also solve those things. <clears throat> so 
So at this point, I'm going to unshare the presentation and use Zoom backgrounds for presentation. So this is the idea of um, the use of narrow AI. This is a depiction of narrow AI. And So one of the funny things here is when Yuval Noah Harari, the best known tech author at the moment, says no one can predict what the world will be like in 2050, you go into Shutterstock and just enter the search term 2050, Shutterstock shows you these various worlds in 2050. So you can argue how accurate these are. So these two have to do with global warming, but this is closer to home. This is a depiction of healthcare, uh, robotic healthcare in uh, 2050. And so it, it does make you think that uh, actually the big problems we have of uh, global warming, uh, nuclear war, and so on, that uh, perhaps the success of uh, DeepMind in, in solving protein folding does mean that it could help us with the other big challenges. I, I don't know that those challenges are, are necessarily bigger than the challenges that exist in uh, protein folding. All right, so now so I'm going to go back to the depiction of narrow AI here and Oh, and share our slides again. Okay, so where does that idea that you could um, have a new presentation slide style from um, Zoom backgrounds come from it has something to do with Leonard Cohen's assertion that I am serially surreal, putting together things other people wouldn't put together, and with former Dean of Arts uh, Leslie Cormack's presentation in our course from November 15th, 2012. So I was very honored that the Dean of Arts was presenting in our course. And I was really disappointed. She came with a slide set of only eight slides and then gave the best talk we've ever had in that course. So it really shows you that the, the assumption that the quality of, of presentation can be based on the number of of slides is not correct. And then it, you, you realize that on Zoom, you have the option of 15 virtual backgrounds, and maybe you're really wedded to seven of those. You'd like to have them always there. But for a new presentation, then you could then um, have eight that are free just for that presentation. So uh, do we have agency? Can we make change? In the particular area that I work in of, of transplant pathology and the Banff classification, things have been pretty slow, you know, and inexact. We're still struggling with borderline changes after 30 years, isolated V lesions <laughs> discussed, it's evidence for rejection still for eight or nine years. And the change is slow, it's well documented, you know who influenced what, but it's pretty slow. And 
it was amazing when Ashita and, and I started doing videos complaining about things online, how quickly things were able to change. I had a presentation blindsided by the future where we were claiming that the human cell atlas project single cell transcriptomics was the future and was being excluded for all major medical meetings. You could find out about it on Facebook, but not by going to your favorite medical meeting. And within a few days after our uh, publication of that online, one of the leaders of the Human Cell Atlas Project, Benjamin Humphreys, was appointed chair of the program committee for the 2018 ASN meeting. I'm not sure the two were related, but they certainly could have been. And then Aviv Regev, who is the big leader of the Human Cell Atlas Project, single cell transcriptomics, uh, she was invited to be one of the five plenary speakers for the uh, 2018 ASN meeting. Very strange though, in a lot of the promotion, there were five speakers, but only four titles. <laughs> unable to ever utter the phrase human cell atlas project, even up to the time that she gave the talk. And then Arthur, author Yuval Noah Harari was claiming that human culture will be stuck because all plot lines in movies, uh, novels, plays, everything, TV shows would be wrecked because in the future, machines will do all the crucial decision-making. Machines will decide who you marry, what you do, because all your friends who did that themselves, their outcomes will be much inferior to people who allow machines to make those decisions. And therefore, human uh, culture will be wrecked. And we said, that's ridiculous, that humans are very flexible, they, they can deal with new situations. If that much intelligence abounds, then our culture will actually be better than it is now. And after we um, published our videos and things on that, um, he later amended his statement to say that the human reaction to mach machine decision-making is a work in progress and we can't make any concrete predictions at this moment. So here's just another example of um, how this kind of change can be enacted. So um, a very well-known popular um, internet personality called the medical futurist um, stated these five points about AI. Um, that they cannot be empathetic, they can't do nonlinear thinking, they cannot interpret data, and that there's always going to be a need for humans because um, machines will never be able to complete certain tasks, and that human-machine cooperation is the ultimate solution. So um, pretty uh, interestingly, this completely contradicts something that was said earlier by the same person was that AI can never replace physicians, but physicians using AI will replace physicians not using AI. So do we have an agency? Can we make change? Taken together, these three examples and many other things that have happened to us uh, suggest that our videos are actually accomplishing things and that we have agency. And as we've said, because you, the audience, are not different from we, the speakers. We did that, you can do that. Now this center picture is uh, Aviv uh, Regev uh, meeting with us right after her ASN plenary talk. And, and it was really fun to meet her in that circumstance. Okay, so we'll move on to our second objectives, that the same technologies that cause burnout among physicians today, which is when they go wrong, they can create a positive medical future when they go right. 
So that, this is probably a very familiar concept to you. Uh, Moore's law, price performance of computing over time and this exponential curve, for instance, predicts that machines will be as smart as, as uh, individual humans in uh, eight years, 2029, and as smart as the whole human race, whole aggregate human race in 2045. And you may have thought that nothing could exceed that, but actually single cell transcriptomics is improving faster than that. So uh, the, the number of cells you can analyze, the price per cell, all, all those sorts of things are, is really moving very quickly. It's a very exciting prospect. So 2045, which is the um, hypothesized singularity when AI will be as uh, intelligent as the entire human race. That's only 24 years from now. So many of us will still be in the workforce by then. So we have to think about what medical careers will look like then. Not necessarily assuming that the singularity will happen, but regardless, there will be a lot of advances in AI that will change um, what the healthcare jobs look like. So physicians will likely have just as much to do as they do today but the schema of what a physician does will likely drastically change. So it won't necessarily be to uh, treat sick patients to bring them back to normal functioning, but perhaps to take normal functioning uh, patients and augmenting their abilities. So um, this is an interesting graphic because um, I think it's something that really speaks to how useful the integration of AI and um, intelligent technology into healthcare would be. So 54% um, of doctors are burned out, 88% are stressed, and 59% of doctors wouldn't recommend that their children pursue medicine. So it shows how much potential there is to help our current physicians. And because most people in healthcare have complex roles that could potentially be delegated to technology, instead of technology contributing to their stress levels like it may be doing currently. So the question is, can we already see artificial intelligence helping with, with the burnout problem? And I, I personally think I can see, I, I should admit that I have a bias and that I, I was an uh, epic uh, uh, super user. So I, I was introducing our new um, medical information uh, program to, to my colleagues, but it, it's clear to me that in the past, our communication means in medicine were inferior to what we were using in our personal life. And now it's really way better that the secure chat that I, I can use today to talk to my colleagues is, is actually a much more efficient type of uh, communication that, than, than I'm using elsewhere. So it is true, I think, we're, we're seeing it actually happen before our eyes that the electronic health records of the future can actually make the, the burden of uh, uh, physician lives less. And it's interesting during the pandemic, before the pandemic started, uh, Ishida and I, I were doing a lot to promote digital pathology and artificial intelligence in pathology. And there was immense resistance to that. But as soon as the pandemic hit, uh, the resistance just sort of melted away and everybody started using digital pathology. So um, here just a few examples of what digitization in medicine can be applied for. So analysis of slides, um, histopathological slides, which is what um, me and Dr. Solez were a part of. Um, computer assisted diagnosis, single cell sequencing, precision prognostics, and individualized treatments. So it seems like at least in the short term and likely for um, a, a long duration of time while we work on improving these technologies, we will be working alongside AI. So studies using deep learning to analyze histopathological slides 
have shown greater efficiency in the use of the pathologist's time and greater accuracy in the slide analysis compared to the pathologist alone. So we can already begin to see how this can um, enhance and improve uh, healthcare. So we know that most machine data projects today need huge amounts of data to train programs. So where do we get this data from? Um, these are just a few examples of the projects already been being developed and being tested for use in healthcare. So like I said on the last slide, um, pathology imaging is an ideal place to apply um, computer-assisted diagnosis. Um, studies have already shown that humans and machine learning systems make different mistakes. So using both of them um, in conjunction can help improve these um, mistakes and kind of remove one uh, one reason that these mistakes are made. Um, they also, computer programs can examine sub-visual features that may not necessarily be caught by uh, a human pathologist. So if AI software can be used to single out and highlight regions of interest, it can save a great amount of time for the pathologist's part and can also make workflow more efficient and safe. Um, in terms of organ transplants, um, there's a significant number of factors that have to be compatible between the donor and recipient. So things like both patients' medical histories, like blood type, body size, medical conditions, um, and even distance between the hospitals and how long a patient has been waiting for an organ. So this process can be streamlined and made even safer using intelligent programs that can be continuously searching for matches using multi-factor analysis. So that's what I'll talk about um, on this slide. So obviously this field is uh, blowing up for computational biologists, but interestingly, there's also a market for non-expert contributors. So it's not necessarily physicians or biologists that have to be involved in this process. So you may know that recently um, companies and institutions have been issuing these online challenges for programming teams and amateur teams to create the best programs they can for specific challenges. And a lot of these are related to healthcare, um, whether it be protein folding or radiology diagnostics. So on the right here is um, just a simplified de depiction of how computational modeling can be used to do in one run what human researchers would have to do as multiple different studies. So in the design of drugs, uh, modern pharma companies have gotten away from having individual humans study many different things. That, that one factor at a time testing gives you multiple protocol versions. It takes a long time and is, is expensive. If you let machines do it all, so let computers design the experiments, robots come back, conduct them through micro uh, fluidics, and then use machine learning for analysis, it's quicker, cheaper, and, and, and seems better in every way. And it's still working on our behalf. There aren't any instances of this going rogue or you know something bad happening. So le leading everything to, to machines has proved to be a, a success story here. So in the Banff classification, uh, you may know that this year we're celebrating the 30th year. And it's amazing how inex inexact and sort of unscientific it still is. I'm, I'm very proud of what we've accomplished, but imagine if we could have, rather than a semi-quantitative consensus generated system, a you know, continuous variable uh, morphometric uh, system where we're going directly from the you know, biology to the, the uh, uh, conclusion about what the patient has and how it should be treated. I'm sure that will come. Uh, it, it's just, just amazing that we're not there already uh, and it's been 30 years. Yeah, so um, here are just some of the applications that um, this kind of system would work with. 
And it's really interesting because when we talk about this big data, which is kind of a buzzword right now that um, is required to form these machine learning programs, um, it's often seen as one of the big challenges that we have to have that amount of data. But the thing is, a lot of this data already exists. So um, from, I, I have some background in pathology and it seems like we already have huge depositories of digital slides that can be used to actually help create these programs. And it can transform this big data into actual actionable data that can be used by physicians and healthcare professionals to actually apply um, the knowledge from all of that amalgated uh, data from all of these different patients. So, um, yeah, what we're trying to say is that every aspect of the medical and healthcare spheres will be affected. And um, an interesting aspect I want to add is that the individualization or personalization of medicine that can be achieved using this model. So it doesn't always have to be a one size fits all approach of trial and error. So our last objective that we want to go over today is that a, phys a physician gains something very valuable by spending time in listening to the views of people very different from themselves. So some of you are maybe aware of this, but uh, 48 and a quarter years ago, in January 1973, when I was a PGY-1 trainee at Johns Hopkins in pathology, I was on my cytology rotation, and I had decided to take five students from Oberlin College for the Oberlin College winter term. So basically, while Hopkins was training me in, in pathology, I was training them in, in like medical research. <laughs> so think about what could happen next and who determines what happens next. I mean, it was my idea to do that, but why did it continue? <laughs> why am I still so closely associated with uh, un undergraduate students? It was because Robert Heptonstall, my boss and mentor, thought this was fascinating. <laughs> no trainee had ever done something like this. And uh, so it was really through his support, the support of the senior person at the time, that I did keep on doing this. And as many of you know, in <laughs> subsequent years, sort of surround myself with uh, young people during much of the day, they are the only options if I want to talk to somebody and it's really worked very well. Uh, Ishida has, has gone through what we call uh, nephrology immersion where she's learning kidney medicine before going to medical school. And uh, I, I think that will turn out very well in the long run. And uh, we have done some very innovative things in the 10 years we've been teaching the technology and future medicine course. And uh, there are many things that we have looked into there that includes tissue engineering pathology. You can imagine us going from current transplant pathology to tissue engineering pathology, where we have stem cell generated or organs. And there are also lots of um, fascinating questions about ethics of the future. Now, it may seem to you like a crazy idea to have so much association with young people and giving them all these roles and what's going on here? Well, that was fine for you to think that until the Biden inauguration where you saw a 22-year-old poet, Amanda Gorman, hold the whole audience spellbound. And so it's kind of a thing. She's been on uh, every popular show and every magazine and, and, and so on. <laughs> anyway, so we're building on her success. Uh, singer Mallory Chipman and I are doing an album uh, combining medicine, science, uh, poetry, and music that will come out. The, 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 
the you know performance is being captured now in March 2021, and it will come out on future day, March 1st, 2022. I don't know if you're looking forward to that or not, but it is coming. And, and it, it ultimately comes out of my uh, activities at uh, Tuesday Night Poetry at the Nook Ca Cafe. We, we call that initiative the future and all that jazz. So that is kind of bringing to mind what the long range future of medicine will be. The um, underlying structure behind the technology and future of medicine course I teach is called medicine writ large, which means there'll come a point where Medicine is not all about uh, treating or preventing diseases because many of them just won't occur anymore, will be easily treated, but it will be about human enhancement and making society better because of the way that society's ills uh, are the ultimate cause of, of many medical conditions. It goes back to what Rudolf Virchow said the age of 27, almost all the quotes from him are the age of 27. It is the curse of humanity that it learns to tolerate even the most horrible situations by habituation. Physicians are the natural attorneys of the poor. The social problems should be largely solved by them. So um, to kind of summarize what we've been talking about in this in this last part ai and the creativity of young people can help promote social accountability in medicine so this idea of social responsibility is why i'm so happy to see um, symposiums like this one that are organized by students and young people because actionable change doesn't have to be limited to physicians or to leaders of the field so like like shane said in the introduction um, there's an increasing need for resources like this, and that's because it's it's us who will be working alongside these increasingly intelligent technologies throughout our careers. So we all have influence into how we move forward regarding AI and medicine, and educating yourself and learning more through conferences like this is a big part of that. Ah, uh, come on. Yeah, uh, it, it has been throughout the presentation hard to get to the next slide. There we go. So the world is our oyster. Narrow AI can offer us amazing help solving all these great problems humans cannot get past. Global warming, nuclear war, male against male aggression, just as it did with protein folding, factoring that symbiosis of us and machines into a narrative for the future. And then you really have something, a very likely positive future, the much wider possibilities than we've ever had before. <clears throat> Thank you. Are there any questions? I'll stop sharing so we can see the people better. So we, we have actually 15 minutes. So uh, bring on the questions. There must be some. <laughs> Feel free to type in the chat and I can relay them to Dr. Solitz and the Shida Moge. Aha. We have one. What are some responsibilities you think academics should have when mentoring their students to prepare them for the future? Well, I think uh, giving them the impression that talking to them is uh, a great privilege, that you don't know which young people you talk to who are going to become much more famous and impactful in the world than you yourself are. 
And so you can always assume that that may be true of any of them. And therefore, spending time talking to a young person is never really a waste of time. And enormous benefits can come from doing that. I guess I'm a living, breathing example of somebody who spent most of their career doing that. And uh, yeah, so I, I really think that's important. And it's quite different from the, I, the prevailing idea that people should hang out with people their own age. And you shouldn't mix people of different ages, something really wrong with that. And that the older you get, the more important you are. And therefore, young people are really unimportant and kind of boring and, and, and uh, just a waste of time to talk to. That, that is really an erroneous thought. So. So how do you think the job of a physician will change as AI continues to be introduced into healthcare? A lot of things will get better and you'll end up less doing less like burdensome things you don't enjoy and, and more things that you do enjoy. And uh, that's the intermediate future, right? maybe a long-term future where uh, physicians are the last uh, humans who actually have jobs. And then finally, a lot of us don't have jobs, but uh, uh, there, there will be a rewarding life and, and uh, AI, probably the science of how to keep humans happy, they'll be much better at that than we, we ourselves are. So there's another question that yeah, almost yeah. got read. It's who yeah. bears the responsibility for preparing mid-career physicians for the adjustments required by working alongside AI? So I, I would bring up what Rich Sutton says about this. He is one of the most prominent AI researchers in the city and uh, in, involved very much in uh, deep mind, that we have to be humble. Uh, just like when we meet a human being who's smarter and more capable than we are. So there, there may be you know, machines like that. We should include them in our circle of uh, empathy, treat them as equals. I know that's probably shocking for some of you, but you should realize how important that belief of Rich Sutton's is, whether you believe it or not. Um, yeah, as a pathologist, uh, what will it look like? Yeah, so you can think of all, all the you know, complaints about the things that I said we had not accomplished in the 30 years of the BAMF classification. If you bring AI into the mix, it will be much quicker to get those things accomplished. And um, so I really think it, it's a very bright future. Uh, you can imagine a kind of conservative view. You know, when anything new is introduced, people secretly think, do I have to learn about that? That's sort of the wrong way to approach life. Um, the students in my course know that I love surprises. I love novelty. I don't know of any reason why it'd be bad for the rest of you to feel like that too. And that includes enjoying learning new things. And one of the new things could be how to sort of work in a co-equal fashion where you do some things better than the AI, the AI does some things better than you. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's really interesting to kind of contemplate this and how deeply ingrained your idea that even when humans are the inferior intellectual species, that we still need to be in charge of everything. What's the reason for that? Um, yeah, so.
uh, I, I think it's worth pondering. I won't be surprised when one of the one of the machines surrounding me starts uh, uh, asking me if, if I wouldn't like to let them do the the heavy lifting now. I think that day will come. There was an earlier question that I just wanted to address really quick. Um, what how, how we would approach the idea of ownership of data sets and algorithms. So I think from what um, myself and Dr. Solis have been doing in the past, I think it's pretty um, open in terms of data set sharing with other researchers as like obviously de-identified, but this is something that we already do. It's not specific to AI, right? It's It, it happens in research all the time. Obviously, um, with specific algorithms that you create, it, it might be different, but I think it's different for different researchers, but it goes back to the idea of social responsibility in that if you have something that can be shared, that can be um, used to improve or like make things more efficient or safe, then I think that falls into the social responsibility of making that accessible to more people. Yeah, I want to thank they okay offensive pictures of a robotic nurse. Um, yeah. So, uh, Yvonne, I okay, I took this as uh, a robotic physician. I, I, I may be wrong about that. Um, and, and it is interesting whether robots should have clothes. I have two robots here they're they're not closed so this is the 2021 this is the 2002 one um, I don't know but I I I find that very interesting that that you do find that and an offensive picture um, and uh, yeah so so but I I can only say that Shutterstock may be entirely wrong about what 2050 will be like, but uh, Yuval Noah Harari is obviously not a Shutterstock user because for him to be able to say no one knows and to have all these specific depictions is, is, is kind of... Uh, so could I jump in with a question for Ishita? Yeah. Uh, what have been your challenges in getting involved in AI as a student? Like what has your approach been? Um, I don't have a um, computer science background. So I have a biology background in neuroscience. So I think it's really interesting because, um, because of how much it relies on collaboration between you know, people of, uh, with different backgrounds. So the biggest challenge is probably um, connecting with the right people to kind of start these kind of projects because it's difficult to go into something without being, you know, an expert in the field. But I think we are getting better at it because lots of people and lots of like young students are taking interest in this. So I think it is getting easier to kind of find groups and people to collaborate with to to kind of start these kind of projects. Yeah, to to the students out there, I, I just want to point out the obvious thing that no matter what field you're in, AI will impact that field. And secondly, that AI is fun. There are very, you know, enjoyable thought, thought experiments you can have about how your work life can be better with uh, AI, no matter what field you're in. So, um, and you, you can sort of think about the difference between an uh, expert in AI, like the next speaker, uh, Osmer, and, and me. I mean, there, there's a role in the world for, for both kinds of people, <laughs> sort of advocates of AI who are really not experts, but sort of accidentally learn 
uh, things about AI. And, you know, Ishida and I sort of fall in that ca category. And then uh, Osmer is an actual expert. But it's important enough in our society that everybody needs to sort of dig in, pay attention, and, and, and uh, you know, participate in, in these uh, interesting interactions. Yeah, thanks for all, all the great uh, questions. All right, I think we've got a couple of minutes before the next talk. I'd like to thank Dr. Solis and Ishida for their nice talk on how AI and medicine all fit together and the importance of youth and collaboration with uh, experts in the field as well.